guests and so glad to have you all here uh, with us. Uh, so we will just go ahead and get started uh, to have respect for your time. And we've got an incredible lineup of colleges to showcase their good work in relationship to the deliverables within these bills. And so really excited to be able to share that with all of you today and really glad to have you here with us. So with that, Christina, if you don't mind, I'll have you pull up the beautiful slide deck we've got prepared uh, for this session. And if you'll go ahead and get to the next um, slide, if you would think that is great. So I am so, so very excited to introduce um, the state board's first uh, dedicated EDI team and department uh, here today. And uh, really glad for this uh, really monumental um, growth of the work, not just within our system of colleges, but uh, very much within our own agency. So really glad to be able to have a team of individuals around me, more, uh, more than happy to introduce or give uh, Melissa and Christina the chance to introduce themselves as well. Uh, but what I'm going to do is uh, introduce myself first. And we've, uh, thanks to Melissa, uh, our team has gone about intros in a different way. Um, so what we've done, uh, moved towards is introducing ourselves in some non-institutional ways. And that is to really center ourselves as people and, and not just employees. And so I'll start and I'll allow Melissa and Christina uh, to roll in behind me. And feel free to, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat as well, feel free to do that as well. So my name is Ha, uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I have the pleasure of serving as the uh, Director of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion with the Washington State Board for Community Technical Colleges. Um, I'm also uh, come from a long line of strong independent women, uh, a mother who, uh, spoke and understood three different languages and a grandmother who was illiterate even within her own uh, native language so not even able to speak read or write in, in Vietnamese. Uh, my family uh, came to the U.S. Uh, after the fall of Saigon the collapse of the South Vietnamese government in um, April of 1975. We were the first wave of uh, boat people who were to arrive uh, stateside to California at the time and made our way up to Washington. Uh, and that's where I've resided ever since. And I have two daughters uh, who couldn't be any more different from each other. And when I think that I've got uh, the parenting thing down, I couldn't be proved more wrong. So that's a little bit about me. And I'm going to pass it off to Melissa uh, and Christina to introduce themselves. Yeah, thank you, Ha. I'm Melissa Williams. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Policy Associate for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the State Board. Uh, I'm new to the role, just a couple months in, uh, and before that I worked at Clark College, so I'm coming from uh, within the system. Um, and I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I've always lived in Oregon and Washington. Um, I am the daughter of Barbara and Ray. I am the descendant of uh, East Coast teachers and engineers and uh, formerly enslaved people and sharecroppers from Texas. Uh, and I am a historian by education. I have a passion for U.S. history, especially social history and African-American history, uh, and I do a lot of community projects related to that work. Um, I also love goats, and I love rugby, so that's a couple of, couple of fun facts about me, uh, and I will pass to Christina. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Christina Pleasant. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the administrative assistant for the team here, um, the equity, diversity, and inclusion team. I'm very excited to be in this work with Ha Melissa. I'm truly proud to be a part of the state board with all these amazing folks. Uh, I've learned a lot already, and I look forward to doing more good work with uh, students in our communities. Um, I'm also a first generation Asian American citizen. Uh, my my mother has, had come from Seoul, Korea. I'm a first generation university graduate as well on both my parents' sides. And um, I was born and raised in Washington State by a single father. I come from a place of love and desire for the constructive and equitable development of our future generations and a progressive society. And uh, so thank you. Thanks for having me. 
Thanks for welcoming me. I'll go on to the next slide where I will thank you for joining us. I ask that um, you go ahead and put your name, title, college, and the reason for joining us in the chat. I will put mine in there as well. Thanks for being here. And we also ask that you please be courteous to others and speak clearly and slowly. Uh, live auto transcription will be provided throughout this Zoom meeting and this presentation will be recorded and include a full transcription, which will be accessible on our new EDI webpage, which we've worked long and hard on. And I'll put that in the chat here. And um, go ahead and take a look at our accessibility statement. SVCTC is committed to providing equal access for individuals with disabilities to its programs and events in accordance with the ADA and 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. If you need any assistance throughout the presentation, please feel free to reach out to me with any tech concerns or additional questions. Just wanted to note that um, during the meeting, we'll be moving pretty quickly to allow our speakers as much time as possible. And the resources will be available in this Google Drive. I'll put in the chat as well. That will include the agendas, the PowerPoints so you can follow along, as well as uh, bill information too. And um, we also will provide a document. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to access this document to submit your questions. And I'll put that in chat. Sorry, I'm bombarding you with links. <laughs> uh, we'll answer the questions in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation or uh, following our sessions in a fax document uh, or upcoming email uh, around the beginning of February or so. So thanks so much, and we can move forward uh, with Melissa. Thank you, Christina. It's, you're always so good at like your speaking <laughs> and then also putting resources in the chat. It's a lot to know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will share the land acknowledgement and labor acknowledgement to get us grounded and started today. Uh, I am coming to you from Vancouver, Washington, which is the ancestral homeland of the Cowlitz and Chinook and other lower Columbia peoples. Um, and so as I read the land acknowledgement, I uh, ask that you please reflect on how you educate yourselves about uh, the people who have inhabited this land uh, and how we have come to the places that we live and work and recreate. Um, and also, if you would like to, feel free to share in the chat uh, the um, ancestral lands upon which you are living and working. That would be really wonderful. Land acknowledgement. SBCTC acknowledges that our community resides on the ancestral lands of the First Peoples. The Office of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges is located in Olympia on the Coast Salish lands of the Nisqually, Cowlitz, and Squaxin peoples. We ask you to join us in celebrating the indigenous tribes of Washington by acknowledging their ancestral lands, their communities, and the past, present, and future generations of the native peoples across our good state. We know that such statements only become truly meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships and sustained commitment. And as such, we commit to continued efforts to build our collective understanding and action to foster authentic native community connections. Hopefully um, your institutions and organizations uh, also have meaningful ways to connect with uh, native communities uh, to make these statements uh, meaningful. Thank you. And I'll move to the labor acknowledgement. We acknowledge that our nation and our institutions have benefited from the free enslaved labor of black people. We recognize the interconnected histories of indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their land and of those who were forcibly brought to it. We acknowledge the enduring impacts of the African diaspora, honor the contributions, talents and dreams of our black communities. We acknowledge the immigrant labor that has contributed to the nation as a critical labor force, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples. We recognize and honor their significant contributions. In these acknowledgments, we commit to the essential work of moving beyond awareness to action through meaningful changes at our institutions and in our communities. 
Thank you. So the purpose of this info session today, uh, there are many purposes, but we've uh, highlighted three for ourselves that we would like to share with you. Uh, and so of course we want to highlight the work of the diversity and equity officers uh, in our state. Um, um, many colleges have uh, folks appointed to this role as uh, vice presidents of diversity and equity um, or other executive level roles. Some colleges do not, uh, and that's okay too. Uh, we're hoping that leadership becomes consistent across the colleges, um, but we definitely want to uh, highlight the folks who are serving in these roles as the experts uh, in this area and to uh, honor their experience, their education, their expertise, their professional work, um, and often their personal work in their communities that are related to, that's related to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and to, um, to use those folks in those roles as kind of the beacon and the people that we are um, using to inform our work and the folks that we are getting guidance from. And so we have uh, collaboratively worked with the diversity and equity officers um, in developing our guidance and in getting input uh, for any models that we might suggest or tools that we might recommend um, in an effort to highlight and elevate their voices. Uh, so that's important to us. Uh, we also, of course, want to emphasize the significance of the state bills uh, related to advancing EDI work in our colleges. And so um, bills 5194 and 5227 are uh, important symbolically as well as logistically, but symbolically in that it is an investment uh, by our state government into uh, the lives of our students and recognizing that we need to operationalize as much as possible and fund uh, the work that is necessary um, to advance equity in our colleges. And then lastly, we want to highlight the actions of our colleges. There's so much good work happening um, from, from yeah, West Coast to East Coast, uh, North and South, all across the state in colleges. And um, we wanna be able to uh, showcase the excellent work and efforts that people are doing, the different initiatives, uh, even before the bills um, came out, the folks have been doing this work for many, many years in different ways. And a lot of that work is dovetailing very nicely with the bills. And so uh, we offer three highlights today from different colleges that we hope you can glean a lot of inspiration uh, from and also uh, connect with colleagues across the state so you can get more information about how you might inform your own efforts. Uh, and so those are our three top um, purposes for you today. And you will hopefully leave uh, feeling like you learned these things and much more. We appreciate your engagement and your time today. Okay, so I'm gonna take a few minutes. Uh, Melissa and I will be giving a brief overview and update on, on gross second substitute bills 5227 and 5194, uh, two bills that shine a light on the importance of cultivating campus spaces where our students, particularly our students of color and minoritized students, feel a real sense of belonging and support for their success. And the bill also posits that our faculty, our staff, our administrators play a key role in creating this environment. So thanks to all of you for being here with us today. Uh, thanks to the good work of many of the colleges in the Zoom room today who stepped into the fire with us this last legislative session and provided testimony for critical components of these bills and helping legislators to uh, perfect, perfect them even further. So big shout out to our uh, diversity equity officers, uh, Dr. Rashida Willard, Parfait Basilet, Robert Britton, uh, Dr. Valerie Hunt, also had uh, Bibi Apojavo from Bellevue College who stepped into a DEI work uh, session uh, last year. Uh, Instruction Commission's Dr. Sayumi Ayeri from South Seattle. There were also presidents and trustees that stepped in to testify, including Dr. Rosie Romano Tranta from uh, South Seattle, uh, Dr. Ivan Harrell from Tacoma Community College, Dr. Timothy Stokes from South Puget Sound Community College, uh, Dr. John Mosby from Highline College uh, and Doug Ma, trustee from South Puget Sound Community College. And but also make sure to acknowledge that there's been a whole host of equity efforts across our system for a good number of years, uh, led by many of you in this room likely, and just incredibly grateful for these new legislative investments to further advance and scale this work. Uh, so really grateful for these appropriations and supporting these efforts further. Um, and I would be remiss uh, to not point again at the diversity and equity officers group um, who have really led um, 
this work, uh, and as well as the Multicultural Student Services Directors Group that has been around for many, many, many years. Uh, I want to make sure to uh, emphasize the good work that they've been doing as well. Uh, the emergence of the President's Equity Committee, uh, the Trustees Equity Committee, and then especially other grassroots groups that don't maybe fit into our formal infrastructure that we have as a system, but have emerged quite readily across the system to consider how to support colleges in implementing requirements of these two diversity bills. Uh, so some, some, some labor, um, some work from many individuals across our system, formal and informal groups uh, in regards to this effort. So really want to be uh, grateful and thank, take the time to thank each and every one of you. Um, invested the time and the labor in ensuring that this effort continues to grow and scale. So I, before I hand off to Melissa to talk a little bit about 5227, I just want to set, uh, make sure that uh, questions are held to uh, the end of the section. We have a, a Google Doc that we'll be sharing as well and asking individuals to place their questions and contact information in that Google Doc so that we can respond to those questions uh, writ large for everybody uh, to have access to the responses. So really glad. Uh, for that if you're able to uh, incorporate those good questions into that Google Doc. So with that, I will hand it off to Melissa to talk a little bit about 5227. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to provide um, a quick overview because fortunately our colleague Summer Kennison will go into more detail uh, about some of the specifics here. So I'm going to uh, give you the, the broad swath here for uh, 5227 diversity in education and there are three uh, primary components or deliverables. Um, and so these are the campus climate assessments, listening and feedback sessions and professional development and training. And so campus climate assessments, uh, the bill outlines that colleges shall conduct a campus climate assessment every five years at minimum. Uh, and this is to understand the current state of diversity, equity, and inclusion on the campus for faculty, staff, and students. And so many, many campuses already have uh, climate assessment processes, um, and many of them are more often than uh, five years. So fantastic if you've already got that set up. Uh, I guess Summer will be able to talk a little bit more about that. And then the findings from the assessment must be posted to public websites. And the objective there is for transparency and accountability. Um, and so um, if you, know, you don't yet have a way to do that, that is something that you can um, uh, learn from other colleges, maybe how uh, others are making that information publicly accessible. And there are some questions about exactly what needs to be made accessible or how much detail. Um, and so that's a conversation that uh, we can have as well. Uh, listening and feedback sessions. Colleges must conduct annual DEI listening and feedback sessions for the entire campus community. Uh, and um, colleges must compensate students for their participation and post findings on the public website. Uh, so there are lots of questions about what compensation might look like. Um, and colleges have different ways of um, compensating and figuring out what they would like to offer students for their participation. Uh, there's, um, it's a, uh, it's fairly flexible and broad. Uh, and then again, posting the findings on the website is part of that accountability and transparency. And then professional development and training. Uh, colleges must provide diversity, equity, and um, uh, inclusion and, and anti-racism training to faculty, staff, and students. Uh, and that will be scaled up uh, over a series of years. Uh, create an evaluation for the participants, share completed evaluations and other program information with the state board annually, and post the uh, DEI training framework on a public website. Um, and so again, because of the work that so many colleges have, have already done, some of these things might already be in place for you, which is fantastic. Um, some of them uh, might be in place, but will require some tweaks. Um, and you might get ideas here today about how you might be able to reshape some pieces or some elements of these. Um, but uh, uh, we are certainly here to guide and to answer questions and to help support you as you are developing these initiatives. Um, and so I want to make sure I didn't forget anything critical here. Uh, again, knowing that we'll hear more from Summer in just a little bit, but have I missed anything, team? I think you covered it beautifully. 
Melissa. Hi. Great, thank you. Okay, so I get to be back on deck with uh, Senate Bill 5194, Equity and Access in Higher Ed. And I love the fact that Carly Schiffner is here in the house because I think she tagged this early on in last year's ledge session when this eventually passed as the kitchen sink bill. And it's because it's an incredibly complex and complicated bill uh, that uh, successful, successfully was passed. Um, for purposes of today, I'll be focusing on two sections of that bill. You'll see in front of you here, section three, which is the overarching DEI strategic plans, and then section five, which I'll speak to next. So if I am someone working on a college campus and I'm looking at this, um, an approach, if you will, uh, for meeting this particular deliverable, I'm going to be looking at creating a broad DEI strategic plan that is inclusive of these uh, four key components that are, you see listed underneath and highlighted in front of you. So the culturally appropriate student outreach program, uh, peer mentoring strategies, a faculty diversity program, and then of course, pointing back to any DEI definitions that you'll be using within any of those plans um, or reports or, um, to be showcased on your public websites. So this is not to say that uh, the DEI strategic plan should only include this, uh, but it is to say that it is uh, legislated that you would be including at minimum these items within that broader strategic plan. Uh, we've had some questions fielded our way in regards to a college's overall strategic plan and if that is sufficient to meet the, the, the requirements of 5194 section three for these plans. I would say yes, if your operational plan or your strategic plan already includes components of this work. Uh, many of our colleges, as Melissa mentioned, are at different stages of, of this work and that might um, be readily uh, evident within their strategic plan that they've that you've already incorporated peer mentoring strategies. You've already been doing outreach to communities of color. You've already uh, integrated a faculty diversity programming piece within that as a, uh, on your college campuses. So if that is uh, true to your strategic plan, then that meets the, de the requirements um, of this uh, particular section. Uh, many other colleges who that may not be the case are beginning to ve develop uh, their own uh, standalone DEI strategic plans as well, and that's okay too. So if that is the way to do the work, I know at the state board, that's one direction that we've sort of attacked this. We're not held legislatively to do this work. We are holding ourselves ethically to do so. So uh, some of our effort has been to run tandem with all of this work that our colleges are doing and replicating that as well within our own agency. So we've got our own equity plan as well as a overarching strategic plan in place. Uh, to, to deliver on some of these items that are relevant um, to our work with the agency. So with that, I'm going to go into Christina, if you would. You are 10 steps ahead of me and so quick, thank you. So another section of this kitchen sink bill is section five, and this is the piece around full-time uh, tenured positions. Um, as many of you uh, may have already know, uh, the colleges are tasked to <clears throat> increase full-time tenure positions by 200 new full-time um, tenure track beginning uh, July of this upcoming year. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Funding for it begins July of this current year. Um, that funding uh, was passed through uh, a number of different channels and stakeholders within the system. Uh, it was originally a $5.4 million dollar <clears throat> um, uh, appropriation for 200 faculty conversions to be distributed. Um, and as the, uh, the good thinking uh, in, around how to distribute uh, that 5.4 million across uh, the colleges, uh, our staff worked with the uh, back, or I'm sorry, the uh, business uh, council group and for, to uh, come up with a proposal that eventually uh, went up to the president's group uh, to be approved. And that proposal was for the 5.4 million to be distributed based on two metrics, 50% uh, based on share of faculty FTE and 50% based on share of historically underrepresented students of color. 
and this is state funded um, FTEs. One of the uh, really important aspects of this portion of uh, 5194 is that colleges should keep in mind the overall intent of the bill, and that is to diversify college faculty in order to improve outcomes for historically underserved students of color. Um, with that, the legislator, legislature recognized that uh, student outcomes and success, especially for first generation underserved students, may be significant, significantly improved by increasing the number of full-time faculty at um, community and tech colleges. Uh, so with that, colleges should keep in mind when implementing these conversions that there is a specific intent from the legislature to have the conversions align with the college's EDI strategic plans, which we just um, talked about. Uh, so really utilizing the the guidance that came from the state board in regards to the conversion piece, I think that came out a couple of months ago. It's also included in the shared Google Drive uh, with these information sessions uh, and also the faculty diversity program guidance that is also included in the Google Drive. Uh, so consider utilizing that. It is in the language of the bill to align with your strategic plans in this way. Uh, and colleges should also consider uh, using that uh, guidance identified in their DEI strategic plan uh, to inform the hiring of the 200 faculty positions. So the takeaway is we're going to be, you've got some fiscal appropriations to help uh, with the recruitment uh, and hire of some new faculty um, and conversions, uh, but also keeping in mind the overall intent in, in the language of the bill to diversify college faculty. Okay, so just put together a visual timeline if it helps uh, with your planning in regards to these requirements within both of these bills. So we're currently in uh, academic year 21-22. So for those of you who have already uh, been uh, deep into this work and have already been conducting campus climate assessments on an annual basis, if you will, can, I would continue the practice if that's a standard of practice um, on your campus. Uh, but for those of, of you who haven't, uh, we would suggest and highly encourage that you conduct the campus climate assessments in tandem to help inform the development of your equity uh, or DEI strategic plans as well. So what that would mean is you're conducting those campus climate assessments, taking those findings and in, any information that's gleaned from those assessments to help inform the development of your strategic plans and the work that you'll be doing in regards to uh, tailoring your peer mentoring strategies and or your uh, outreach to communities of color and so on and so forth um, and, and as well as the uh, faculty diversity program. Um, and so you'll see across and I won't go through uh, every <clears throat> every block but you'll see uh, the listening feedback sessions should occur on those years that the campus climate assessment does not. Uh, so make sure to include that as part of your process, that there is these full-scale listening and feedback sessions that are inclusive of faculty, uh, staff, and students. Uh, and Melissa pointed to the DEI anti-racist training uh, coming out of the gate academic year 22-23. Again, many of you may have already been incorporating this. Um, the first round of that is uh, targeted at all new faculty and staff with a goal of 8% to complete the training every two years. Uh, so be mindful of that as well as you're looking at tailoring that. Another aspect to be thinking about and uh, uh, Clark College is one who's been doing a really nice job of this um, in their work, is uh, thinking about how to track uh, individuals, uh, faculty, staff, and students who are completing the training uh, on your campus. And we're also exploring a way to assist, uh, system-wide tracking through CTC link that may not come into play uh, for another year until post full CTC link rollout um, and sort of a review of what that looks like before we uh, are able to uh, request the integration of a system-wide tracking system, but do know that we are uh, having conversations in that direction. And then as you'll see, the DEI anti-racist training, again, as Melissa mentioned, begins to scale itself across all new faculty and staff, and then come um, academic year 24-25, you'll see now 
it is uh, providing uh, this training for all degree seeking students. Go ahead. And I think this is where we are going to hold questions uh, to preserve time for our college showcases and for uh, some guidance coming from Summer Kennison and our work with um, her on the campus climate assessment. So please utilize the Google Doc that Christina shared to add any questions you might have, and we will make sure to respond to those um, as soon as we can. Okay, so I'm just gonna tee up the presenters that you'll see in front of you. Uh, you'll be hearing a, a good deal of information from our very own Summer Kennison, who is the Interim Director of Research with the State Board for Community Tech Colleges and an esteemed colleague, and so glad to share space with her always. Uh, a little bit on the faculty diversity model templates in working uh, with the HR department with Julie Huss. I believe she may still be on the call. I know she's been pulled in a number of different directions uh, during ledge session. Uh, there'll be just a little bit on uh, this portion today, you'll be hearing more opportunities for some February events to build out on the faculty diversity uh, model guidance. So stay tuned for more of that. Uh, and then of course, our favorite part, our college showcases uh, with South Puget South Community College Parfait Basilet in regards to the work that South Puget has done to incorporate their outreach to communities of color and peer mentoring strategies uh, to meet the deliverables within uh, 5194. Uh, we also have Yakima Valley College, Jeanette Quintero, who will be sharing a little bit about the process that Yakima took in developing their DEI strategic plans. Again, another item required within 5194. And then Dr. Rashida Willard from Clark College will be sharing the incredible work she and her team have done in regards to introducing and scaling their DEI anti-racist professional development trainings. There And of course, I believe if I'm not miss, uh, speaking out of turn, Dr. Rashida Willard uh, uh, will, can also point to some of the ways in which um, Clark has done their tracking um, of their professional development as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Summer. Great, thank you, Ha. I'm going to talk um, for the next few minutes more specifically about the campus climate assessments um, and a little bit on the listening and feedback sessions under 5227 because those have been uh, pretty urgent in terms of getting those implemented so they can provide some information toward the DEI strategic plans um, and the ongoing calendar as defined in, in 5227. Uh, Haas gave you a very excellent um, summary of kind of what the campus climate assessments are about um, and what their sort of overall um, objectives are. So I'm going to go straight into our guidance. So Christina, I'll take the next one. So as part of the requirements uh, within the bill 5227 for the state board uh, was to produce some a model for the campus climate assessments. Um, so Ha and I worked uh, with a number of different groups to get some information about what this really should look like um, and what would be most beneficial to the college and most relevant and allow each college to uh, identify the tools and the procedures that are most suitable for them and their student bodies. So we conducted several consultation sessions. Uh, we had um, several sessions with students and faculty and staff of color uh, who came and gave us very, very open and honest um, uh, descriptions of what their expectations were, what they felt the priority should be, uh, concerns from previous iterations of campus climate assessments. And we were able to take the results of this and really kind of move forward on thinking about how we wanted to do the, the guidance. And so where we're landing on this is that the state board is not going to produce like a specific um, sample survey uh, for a number of reasons. One is it's really going to be about the um, the adaptability for different colleges, trying to produce something that is, that is the right thing for all campuses is going to be um, virtually impossible. But also we wanted to make sure that as we move forward in 527, that this sort of activity 
really reflects the direction of the subject matter experts. And those will come from your diversity and equity officers um, and whoever who is assigned to those roles if you don't have a formal diversity and equity officer. And so we met with the DUSC's uh, subgroup on 527, um, and they gave us a lot of insight on what their expectations would be, uh, and particularly on some of the concerns that um, have risen in previous campus climate assessments, particularly those focusing on, on race. So what we will be doing is producing a guidance document um, that's available, I believe, in the Google Drive now, which will summarize some of our findings um, and some of our recommendations. And what we're doing is we're working through a number of commercially available campus climate assessments, um, some for students, some for faculty and staff, and some that cover both. Uh, and those will be shared with colleges so that they have a, a range of, of existing instruments to choose from and work with. And I'll talk a little bit more about kind of how, how to choose one uh, if that's the direction that your college wants to go. Uh, this does not preclude developing something in-house or using something that you already have. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that um, in a second. All right, next slide. So this is the, uh, I think, probably one of the most important parts of um, determining how your campus climate assessment is going to be selected and, and run. And there really are three primary overarching principles. The first is that the campus climate assessment should be inclusive. The requirement in the bill actually describes that the campus climate assessment must be selected and administered through a college consultation that includes students, faculty and staff, and diversity and equity officers. So even if you intend to use something that you've already had uh, and you want to keep doing that, you'll still need to go through that consultation process to ensure that that is still the most valid and appropriate tool. And we're encouraging everyone to document that and also to make sure that whatever consultation groups that you use are also uh, diverse and representative of your campus. They should be transparent. We expect that the CCAs would be administered and the results analyzed and published with integrity and openness. And that's another argument and in many cases for looking at um, using an externally administered campus climate assessment uh, where the student responses, the uh, faculty and staff responses are handled by an external agency and then findings are returned back to the college. That the campus climate assessment should be impactful. The findings from the campus climate assessment should be used to inform DI strategic plans and the professional development program and they should be a meaningful part of college improvement plans overall. Next. And thinking about impactful, there are some outcomes to consider around the campus climate assessment. There are some requirements in the legislation that beginning July 1st, colleges must submit reports to findings and or progress on their CCAs and their uh, listening and feedback sessions to the state board. These findings must also be published annually on the college's website. Um, with either the results of the CCA or the listening sessions or both, if you have both in a year. We are strongly encouraging campus climate assessments to inform the development of strategic plans and professional development training. And that in this publication, that you maximize transparency at the college through open communication with your students, faculty, and staff on the CCA selection or the design if you're doing something yourself or looking for a few um, self-design questions but also the implementation, how the CCAs are communicated and um, how the, the campus population can participate in the CCA, and then the analysis, and then ultimately the findings. By the end of 2024, the State Board will prepare, prepare a report for the legislature that will, at a minimum, summary the results of the completed CCAs. This last piece is really significant. There's been a lot of questions about this and some anxiety, but the, to maximize the contribution of campus climate assessments to DEI strategic plans and professional development and other programs, colleges are strongly encouraged to complete at least an initial campus climate assessment before July 1st, wherever possible. Okay, next one. Now, as I mentioned, the State Board is not preparing or mandating any specific campus climate assessment instrument, but we'll provide a list of suggested existing tools that work for students, staff, or both, and that we feel meet the requirements and the expectations of the bill. And you'll see those in the guidance document. There's a list of those, but it will be an evolving list. 
um, as we gain more experience, as colleges might develop or work with some new tools, we'll be updating and amending that list as we go along. Again, note the requirement to consult with faculty, students, DEI officers, and staff in the selection or development of an instrument. Even if you are using an existing instrument or you're choosing something that's commercially available, you're designing something in-house, you still need to take this process to take place. And we, again, we encourage you to document that consultation process, its findings, and its outcomes. The State Board may require colleges to repeat the campus climate assessment. We hope that that doesn't happen, but if you have any concerns about the design or implementation of your campus climate assessment, please reach out early to the State Board, um, either to Ha or myself. We've already had a few colleges come to us with questions um, and looking for some guidance and advice and some specifics of this process, and we are more than happy to help. Next. So when selecting instruments, there are a few things to think about. If your college is trying to decide between going with something that is produced outside or developing something in-house, regardless of what you may have used before. There are a number of benefits for using a commercial instrument. The main one really is that impartiality. Uh, it encourages participa participation because it uh, creates confidence and confidentiality. Uh, they are professionally administered, so they can be very efficient. They are professionally developed and analyzed. And in many cases, they've already gone through a centralized institutional review board evaluation. So if you, that's a requirement at your campus, uh, that may already meet that need. Another piece of this is the potential to do national benchmarking or comparisons of findings. Now, of course, these do have a cost. Um, they have structured questions, so there's less control over the questions, although most of the commercial tools do allow uh, users to develop at least a few custom questions. There may be limitations on timing. Some are only administered, for example, in fall quarter. And because you're not working with the full set of data, there may be some limited um, detail and breakdowns in the analysis that you can do. With in-house instruments, you can design something that is very specific to your own institution. You can administer it at any time. You can adapt it to meet any specific student needs. Uh, and this could be very helpful in terms of accessibility. For example, being able to translate your campus climate assessment into other languages if that represents your student population. The disadvantages, of course, include challenges to ensuring that transparent impartiality. You might need to go through an IRB process, which can be time consuming, especially with this, this timeline. It will still, there will still be a cost in terms of how you, you design, administer, and analyze results. Um, that is not a small amount if you don't already have something in place that, that you're going to continue to use. So keep that in mind. It takes time to develop tools. Uh, it takes time to plan and administer these yourself. And it will take time to administer those results and get them to a place where they can be meaningful for you to work with. It can be difficult to ensure security and confidentiality of the responses. And you will be dependent on the available design and analysis skills that you already have in-house. Um, and you will ultimately have limited offer options for peer comparisons or benchmarking. I will say in terms of commercial costs, there are some tools that are considering um, some group pricing. And I know there are instruments like the PACE survey for faculty and staff that are already in use by several colleges. And that is one organization that has already reached out with um, options for doing some sort of consortium pricing. And I'll talk about a little bit more about consortium in a minute. And then there's also the possibility of working with um, some of your peer colleges who also want to develop something in-house and try and share some of your resources and expertise um, and create some possible um, benchmarking comparisons with common questions. Next. If you are going to work in a consortium, that's perfectly okay. Um, and that may help with the design or the purchase of an instrument. Uh, however, we do want to point out that if you are working in a consortium, you must still meet the requirement to consult with your own faculty, student, DI officers, and staff. That can't be done collectively across the, the consortium. It still needs to be documented and completed at your own campus. You must publish and submit findings that reflect the outcomes from your own college, not collective results. That said, the benefits of the consortia do include the potential to reduce some of the administration time and cost and create opportunities for very focused peer comparisons and benchmarking. Okay, next. And I want to go back over some of these key points around inclusion and accessibility because 
a lot of the feedback that we had from those consultation groups really was about making sure that every student, uh, faculty member, staff member would be able to participate uh, and would be encouraged to participate and would feel confident in participating. So however you go forward with whatever instruments you choose, you are encouraged to consider strategies that do ensure that all students and employees are appropriately informed in a timely manner of the administration of the campus climate assessment and how they participate. So that happens before you're actually administering the, the tool. So you want to be sure that there's enough time for everyone to have heard about it, to be familiar with it, to ask any questions about it, uh, and to develop that confidence and participation. Ensure that the notification and administration of the CCA does not exclude, exclude any participants because of accessibility, technology, or other support issues. And again, if you have any questions about that, we do have resources at, at the state board um, who can help with, with any questions that, um, or procedural issues that you might have or technology challenges that you might be concerned about. Uh, we have a officer in the uh, education division, Monica Olson, uh, who is very enthusiastic and knowledgeable and committed to this work. Um, and she is an excellent resource. Ensure that the participation of students under age 18, excluding emancipated minors, includes appropriate credential consent. So that if you have a lot of running start students or college and the high school students, this is really important to be aware of. Many of the um, proprietary tools, uh, they will either, they will filter out the responses from students that are under 18, or they will ask that you read them out before that starts the process. However, we're really not, um, not encouraging uh, colleges to necessarily think about um, that those students' voices don't matter. So where you can uh, work with parental consent um, and informed consent for your students under 18, that's a really valid way to go forward and ensure that those students can fully participate. But we want to be sure that we raise the, the, the issue of the legal aspects of working with this type of survey with students under age 18. Ensure that adequate services are available for participants that experience trauma or distress from participating in the CTA. The process of self-reflection, reflecting on campus experiences, and simply completing the campus climate assessment can bring to the surface existing and historical pain. And we want to be sure that students are adequately informed before they start this process of what support services are available to them. And the same as holds true for faculty and staff. Being prepared with um, easily accessible resources, uh, making sure that that information is communicated before the campus climate assessment starts, it will be really significant in helping students and faculty and staff reach out if they do experience trauma as part of this process. Colleges should communicate and administer the campus climate assessment in multiple language if that's appropriate for your students, staff, and faculty. That also means thinking about how you analyze responses that may be in a language other than English. Uh, in order to protect the um, cultural implications of, for students that are working in their first language, uh, we would encourage the analysis to take that into account. Um, and rather than dropping into translating responses back into English, to be thinking about the cultural implications of how language is used uh, and make sure that you have the expertise to help with it, uh, the analysis in the original language that the student or the faculty member staff is using for the CCA. Okay, next. So these are some of the survey tools that um, are already in the list for um, that, were, that are suitable for students. Some of them are suitable for both. Uh, and this will be added to um, a resource bank. Um, the Research and Planning Commission, uh, who has been working through, through me and with HA and the DEOC to kind of assist with the logistical side of administering the campus climate assessment, uh, they are producing a um, pretty extensive document that will be capturing the experiences of colleges as they work through their campus climate assessments and creating a resource bank of things like um, common questions, um, advice on developing uh, the uh, and administering the feedback sessions, um, like what they know about costs um, and where there are consortiums that might be developing. So it'll be a pretty extensive tool to, for colleges to look to if they're having some overall questions about what might be happening or what and being able to draw on the experience that's already out there. Next one. There are fewer tools that are designed specifically for employees in higher education. Uh, there are a number of tools that are available for the school district or for private um, enterprise, but 
very few tools that are available for this type of work for higher education community, uh, employee communities. Three here um, are significant. These three are already in use at at least one college in the system, so there is experience out there. Um, and they're, they are three tools that we consider would be appropriate for that group. Next. Now, the listening and feedback sessions is going to be perhaps the most resource intensive piece of the student consultation part of 5227. Um, and there's understandably a lot of questions coming up about how this could work um, and how best to administer it and work with the data that's collected. Uh, and so we are working on preparing some additional guidance for the colleges on their listening and feedback sessions. Um, we do welcome input uh, from the experiences that you have or questions that you have so that we can make sure that that um, starts out as comprehensive as possible and stays comprehensive and relevant. We are looking at some primary areas right now. Um, some that have come forward to us are about how to select and train facilitators. Um, particularly if you choose to work with facilitators um, from outside, there are a number of community groups that do this type of work. Um, and that has the advantage that it enables the participants to be speaking and working with people who are not from their campus. That's uh, very important for confidence and transparency. Um, transcription tools for the large amount of qualitative data that will come out of these sessions. Qualitative analysis tools and resources to kind of help you work with that data and work with it with uh, research integrity. The bill does describe compensation expectations for participants. That is a complicated area uh, in the public, public system. Uh, and so we're looking at getting some advice on how best to go about that, but also what sort of alternatives are. Um, not all compensation needs to be cash. So they're being able to kind of figure out what your students' needs would be and looking at ways that you can meet those, um, those student needs through other, other methods. Inclusivity and accommodations. Um, again, thinking about um, feedback sessions that are in multiple languages, um, where you host them, how you do them, whether there are technology or accessibility issues, um, and about how you structure those. Uh, to make sure that the students and the faculty and staff that are participating uh, feel safe and confident in that environment. And then resources and support that will be available. There is some expertise around the system in uh, working in, for example, focus groups. So we're trying to work through the Research and Planning Commission to kind of see where we have some of these technical tools that are available, uh, particularly to help with transcription and qualitative analysis, so that if you don't have that on your campus, we might be able to find a mentor for you in the system um, that can help your college with some of this work. And that's everything for me. Again, um, if you have any questions about uh, the, the campus climate assessments or the feedback sessions, please reach out to myself or Ha. Uh, we are really enjoying being informed <laughs> by <laughs> what we're hearing, and it's going to help us make sure that we're able to produce information that's going to be helpful to the to all of the colleges in the system um, and make this as effective as it can be. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Summer. I want to also point to the Google Drive as well uh, to mention that all of this good information uh, is embedded within that Google Drive. Uh, within the campus climate assessment guidance portion uh, document that you'll see there. There is also a stakeholder feedback document. I think that's what we named it, Melissa, uh, that uh, we pulled together all of the feedback from those groups that Summer mentioned that we reached into for some good information um, and guidance to help inform this particular aspect of um, uh, the requirement. Uh, so you'll see that there. Melissa did a fabulous job of pulling out the themes uh, for all of you to consider as you think about the selection of your instrument as well as um, how to, to implement that across your college. So that I'm going to just take a, a quick few minutes. Uh, I think Julie may still be here. Julie has from uh, the HR office uh, at the state board. I want to welcome her as well. I think I know that she has to peel away rather quickly. Uh, we have a few minutes just to do a brief overview of this section. Again, I'm, I pointed to some opportunities that will be coming in February that will build this particular portion out uh, to share out some guidance uh, and some college showcases. 
Uh, but if you remember in 5194, it outlined the requirement for those DEI strategic plans and embedded within that is the requirement for uh, colleges to develop a model faculty diversity program that is designed to provide for the retention and recruitment of faculty from all racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds, as well as be based on proven uh, practices and diversity hiring processes. Uh, so in keeping with uh, the decentralized nature of the community tech college system, we find ourselves in, in the, the aspect of local control for each individual college. Uh, the state board will not mandate a specific program to be created and delivered, uh, but does provide a list of resources and considerations uh, in a faculty diversity uh, program template document uh, that is also in your Google Drive to uh, assist you in developing your own faculty diversity program that is tailored to your own college. Uh, the resource list is solely intended to provide options in support of each college's faculty Diversity program, there's no requirement whatsoever for colleges to use any of the resources. Um, and it just intends to provide uh, colleges a blueprint to assist with the development of this program, uh, which is again, a key component within the 5194 mandate for the DEI strategic plans. Uh, the model template uh, again, provides resources to consider not required for colleges to utilize any of them. Uh, we also went about with an approach of um, eliminating duplication of effort. And so uh, many of you uh, in the Zoom room with us today may remember that all of our colleges were required to submit uh, a workforce diversity plan uh, per the exe uh, uh, executive order 20-02 in this last December 2021, I believe, Julie, tell me if I'm misspeaking on the date on that. Uh, but all of our colleges were tasked as well as the state board agency to um, submit a, their own workforce diversity plan, uh, very similar to uh, a faculty diversity programming piece uh, to the Office of F Financial Management. Uh, so we adapted components of that plan. Uh, so for colleges who did indeed submit, uh, you have a starting point uh, to work from. Uh, we also adapted the template to include components of that uh, as well as more. So hopefully that is helpful. We'll speak more to it in our February events that you'll hear more about soon. Uh, but to get you started is just this overview um, and then the guidance document as well. And I am, go ahead and, uh, Next slide there, Christina. So happy to introduce our first college showcase and highlight South Puget Sound Community College with uh, Parfait Basile, who will be speaking about the incredible work that South Puget has been doing in regards to the peer mentoring and outreach to communities of color there at the college. So Parfait, it's all yours. Awesome, thank you so much, Ha. Um... Christina and uh, Melissa, thanks for the opportunity. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Um, my name is Parfait Basley, and the Executive Diversity Officer here at South Puget Sound Community College. Um, and I was asked to share um, a bit about the work we've been doing at the college uh, regarding uh, peer mentoring of students uh, from historically underrepresented uh, groups, as well as efforts to um, connect and build an outreach program with uh, the local high schools and communities that serve um, those student groups. So I will sequentially start with the peer mentoring strategy um, and then uh, build into uh, the, the outreach um, process. Um, so most of you are probably familiar with um, uh, federally funded TRIO type programs that are, um, they've been around uh, to help support um, students who are uh, either first generation, low income, um, um, and and so the the uh, the impetus for our, our program that I'm about to talk about, uh, and I can get to the next slide, um, Christina, if you don't mind, um, was inspired by um, those programs. Uh, but first and foremost. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do at the college uh, with our equity work is to ground it in our guiding principles uh, as we look at those as our North Star um, and reminders uh, as part of our process of continue, continual uh, improvement. So our equity principles are 
uh, threefold. I like to call it a three-legged stool. Um, and the first one, the first principle is the notion of centering those whom we seek to serve and um, wanting to meet them where they're at um, as we develop solutions. Um, the second pillar and principle is the notion of continually identifying barriers to both academic and professional success and a commitment to wanting to remove them no matter the difficulty of what those barriers might be. And thirdly, the notion of involving those most impacted um, when we try to seek and find solutions uh, while making decisions. So those principles were um, at play when we uh, were in the process of designing um, the two peer mentoring equity programs that are student centric. Uh, next slide, we'll give you a little overview on those programs. So the first one, if we were to look at the timeline and the sequencing of the, the, the design of these programs, we first started with Ignite. Um, and as you can see on the screen, it's a program that um, sought and still seeks to, to help students who are either low income or they identify as students of color um, or they have a documented disability with our institution. Um, or they are first generation students uh, attempting to get um, a college degree. So if any of those, um, those characteristics are true, um, students is eligible for the program. Um, and so we started with that program, um, just knowing the need in our community, the need um, to have those wraparound support around our students. Um, and also, we were unable because of the demographic of our college, unable to tap into the federal grant for TRIO. So the commitment was still there. So we did work with our uh, foundation to secure some, some funding with some community sponsors um, in order to, to have enough um, fiscal support to, to proceed with the program. And so as we run the program for about two years, uh, we continue to look at the data institutionally and the data pointed uh, pretty clearly that the demographic group that was least served by our institution was our Black and African-American students. And therefore, using, using the data, we were able to, um, to make the argument to stand up an iteration of the IGNITE program with a focus on Black and African-American students. Um, and the two programs provide, in, in many ways, similar services um, with the distinction that will be in the next slide, uh, that uh, for our uh, Black scholars, uh, next slide, please, it's coming, <laughs> here we go. So, um, so as in, in a nutshell, the overview of what the students get is what you see on the screen. So there's a promise of a community. You know, they, they, they have a cohort of students from similar lived experiences and, and interests and challenges. And so they can, can, they can build that community. Um, they get assigned an educational planner or advisor um, to work with them with course enrollment, um, program selection, uh, and navigating just <laughs> the challenges that occur as uh, we, we, we go through school. Um, and then they get a, a assigned a peer mentor, um, and which is another student, uh, you know, at our school, either uh, a year ahead or um, a student who's concurrently going through college, but they 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 they've demonstrated a um, uh, a knowledge or competency of navigating our system and or a willingness to just be in a position of leadership. And so we wanted to we want to weave that as an opportunity for growth for those students. Um, and the way we've designed the peer mentoring uh, program, and that that's. There's some resources I'll be happy to share for those who are more interested in the, the ways we've operationalized it, but we've built it as a case management approach where there's actually a communication plan. Um, there's, a, um, there's a system in place for, um, for students to check in and take notes and a reporting. When I say reporting, it sounds more formal than it is, but a, a mechanism through which uh, peer mentors can escalate if um, there are red flags to issues that can become retention issues. So they, they can notify our uh, assistant director of the multicultural center or the advisor, depending on the nature of the, uh, the red flag or yellow flag. Um, and so the students also get uh, laptops if that's a need. Uh, their textbooks are automatically provided to them on a quarterly basis. 
Um, they also are able to register early for classes so that um, um, that doesn't become a barrier to their graduation uh, timeline. And then there's a few other perks as you can see on the screen, uh, funding for them to attend uh, stu uh, uh, student of color conferences and any other conference that might be relevant to their identity. Um, and then um, one, one aspect of the programming that I really, really enjoy and that the students have spoken qualitatively, um, you know, highly, uh, of is the the life and academic skills um, workshops and trainings that we we provide based on um, an assessment of what their needs are, both through conversations that the ed planner uh, have with students based on what the peer mentors are sensing, but also based on what the students are telling us they want to know about and learn about. So we bring community partners ranging from financial advisors um to former to alumni from 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 the college and neighboring schools to share about you know life skills that might be helpful for students um, to be successful um, but as you can see in bold there the main distinction for the black scholars is we were able to secure some funding with our foundation and provide um, a 500 dollars scholarship towards tuition for every 45 credit that a student completes within the program. And the rationale there was to build on our guided pathways work, um, you know, in partnership with the state board, where we know, um, you know, through the research that, you know, the student achievement indicators that student, uh, when students complete um, certain, uh, um, complete certain credits on, on their academic journey, and the milestones are 15 credits, 45, um, that I think it's also 30, but at any at any of those critical milestones, the, the likelihood of the student uh, completing and graduating go go out higher. And so based on that data, those data points, we, we built this model of in, uh, incentivization whereby um, as we encourage students to stick around and work through the challenges with us and the team that we, we're providing, um, that once they reach the 45 credits, they get um, a little a little break from a tuition uh, burden. So, um, and the results are, 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 are rather interesting and I'm about to show some of the outcomes um, from a qualitative and quantitative standpoint. So the next slide um, illustrates some of those measures of success. No, I've, I've, I've lied. <laughs> so prior to that, I guess there's one element of the, the program that I wanted to highlight in terms of um, ways we, we've designed it. So initially, when we stood up the Ignite program, we had your traditional enrollment process, which, you know, which is typically a, a um, registration time frame, a deadline, and then you know, we process the application and then people come in and then they get an onboarding and so forth. Uh, but what we had failed to notice at that time was that the, the program was essentially centering your typical type A students who were able to be on top of things and track with the deadlines. And so based on feedback, um, you know, and noticing that students will at times find out about the program and then, well, that would outside of the window of applications um, and we would be the bearers of the sad news. Yes, you know about us, but we can't help you. <laughs> We, we, we decided to shift gear and actually really center those students. And so we did away with the quarterly um, um, deadline enrollment model and moved to a continuous en um, uh, enrollment model. And a, a lot of the, the pandemic and the need to operate remotely has also helped with that when we went into that direction. So that's one of the features of the program. So at any given point, when a student hears about it, they can come and then here we go. Um, so qualitatively, you can see some of the, the, the comments that students have said over the years um, about what the program has meant for them. Um, it's, it just provides them with the support that they need um, and just that community um, and that, that, that glue, the bridge between instruction, student services, and other resources within the college. Um, next slide. Um, this, I'll take you a little more quant quantitative here. Um, some of the uh, measures of success that we've used are directly aligned with our institution-wide equity um, uh, measurements. 
and also align with um, what I was talking about earlier, the student achievement indicators from the guided pathways um, uh, project. And so you can see that um, in, on the left-hand side in blue for our Ignite students, um, so the first quarter retention, so students who complete the you know, 15 credits, um, you know, for students who fit the same profile as our Ignite students, um, they they have a 65% completion rate, if you will, of 15 credits, whereas our Ignite students are at 80%. Um, and on the green side there with the Black Scholars, you can see also the, the, the difference that the program is making. Uh, there's higher first quarter retention rates for our Black Scholars um, than uh, non-Black Scholars that fit the same profile. Uh, next slide. The next uh, milestone is the fall to fall retention. Um, and you can see a similar impact of the program as well. So our Ignite students have a 71% fall to fall retention uh, versus non-Ignite students with the, a similar profile. On the Black Scholar side, we, we only have one year of operation so far. We launched a program last year um, and, and still we see a, a marginal um, uh, uh, lead here with our Black Scholar students, uh, but we'll continue and see what, what, what happens over the years. Next slide. Um, this, this one focuses on, on top. It's a little stacked up here, but bear with me. The first slide is the, um, you know, in terms of um, SAI milestones. So when you look at 15 credits, um, you can see for the general population we have in 2021, which was heavily hit by the pandemic, we had a 28% uh, completion rate for all students uh, put together versus 64 for black scholars and 47 for non-black scholars. Um, and then for the 40, uh, the 30 college credits, um, and those students who've completed 45 credits, so from 30 to 40, you can see also the numbers, 48 for all students together, 50 for Black scholars, and then 56 for non-Black scholars. So with that, again, all that to say, the program is working, the peer, the peer mentoring, the community building, the wraparound is working, students are finding the value and they're, they're succeeding more. Um, next slide. So this then is a perfect segue to the next leg, right? The next step to, to this. So we build the program while the students are with us. And so the intent of the bill was, okay, how do we create this pipeline and reach out to our communities and the high schools and ensure that the transition into college, into support programs like this is, is, uh, is well put in place. So there was some funding provided um, to help fund um, the, high, the hiring or the recruitment of some outreach specialists to help with that. So the way we are going about it, and we are actively in the process, in, in the process of hiring right now, the, the job description is out in the world and we're hoping to, to get someone who will help us towards this goal. But our intent, I wanted to highlight a few bullet points here in terms of how we are going about it, how we decided to, to do this at SPSCC. Um, so this will be a full-time outreach specialist. Um, they will be housed in the student services in the outreach department um, and with a dotted line. So from, from an organizational stand, uh, structure standpoint, they will be reporting um, with a dotted line to my office. But the, the decision was made to house them in the outreach area because that will set them up for the greater success um, because the outreach office has history and is in the on the ground doing outreach work. This is not new for us, um, but we wanted to make sure that there was definitely this organizational liaison to our office in order for this individual to be made aware of uh, important um, strategies, important contexts, uh, communities that they need to work with. Uh, but from an operational standpoint, uh, working with other outreach specialists and getting the support that they need. Um, some of the elements in the job description are essentially uh, intention, uh, intentionally having this outreach specialist spend time in the high schools of interest. You know, in our area, we're talking about North Thurston, um, we're talking about Timberline, we're talking about Shelton. Um, so wherever there's a concentration of those, uh, those populations that we want to make a break breakthrough with. Um, and then, this individual also will be a representative of our college um, in um, various spaces in our 
community with historical partners um, and helping put together events uh, with the intent of exposing um, students, uh, high school stu age students and beyond to the opportunities of, of higher ed and the support programs that we have um, and helping also with the, um, the financial aid application uh, process um, because we know that our state is, is not faring up very well with um, um, financial aid uh, completion rates at the high school level. So those are pieces that we've woven into the job description uh, for this outreach specialist. So that's about it. So it's still in, in the works, this, this particular piece of the, the outreach, um, but we really are uh, confident and at this is, let's say, hopeful that it will play a pretty, uh, it will play a complementary role to the Ignite and Black Scholars program that we already have stood up um, as we, we are, we have this individual in the community uh, talking about this program so that students can come in. So thank you for your time. And uh, I will just pause there and I'll be monitoring the, uh, the Google Docs if there are any questions related to this. That was beautiful, perfect. Thank you so much for that. I, I always wanna call attention to the incredible integration of that work, but also that you and your team intentionally uh, took into account the SAI uh, model utilized within our state. And then of course, integrating that within the, the work within the Guided Pathways Initiative. So uh, really appreciate that and being able to monitor all throughout any kind of um, growth and progress in support of our students of color. So thank you so much for that. I think the next person up is Jeanette Quintero. I'm not sure if the, uh, if Dr. Guzman and Steven Sonica are here with you or not, but welcome to the both of them as well. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. Thank you, hi, I appreciate it. Um, just wanna say thank you um, for letting us be here today and, and letting us share our thought process for approaching the ADI strategic plan work, you know, that's required of the, <clears throat> the legislative bills. Again, I just, I know this last time I said I was sick, I'm still kind of trying to get over that. So just be patient with me as I get through this um, presentation. First off, um, <clears throat> I want to say thank you to all our team at YBC, which includes Steve and Dr. Ilda Guzman. We have Wilma here today, who's also been part of the work at EDI. We have Steven Rodrigue, who's one of our faculty members that's going to be helping um, with this work. And so, again, just want to say thank you to that team. Um, you know, we were approached by the state board asking just to see if we'd be able to share our thought process on approaching the EDI strategic plan, and we're very happy to do so. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we won't be sharing our draft version just yet. Um, we are in the preliminary stages. Well, it's pretty much drafted, but we you know we do still have some work to do with it with regards to, you know, um, the campus climate assessment informing our work and just organizing on what that's going to look like. We hope to have it, you know, finalized probably here in the next couple of months. Um, first off, I think for us, it's, it was very important when we started on, on this work a couple of years ago with the drafting of our college's strategic plan. The way a strategic plan was wrote was through an equity lens. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. It was through an equity lens. And so we approached that work in, in the version of teams. So that approach that we took to building that plan is gonna be the same approach that we're taking to um, develop our EDI strategic plan and then moving forward with the work that's required of the bills. Um, with that came the building of strategic plan work groups. And um, Christina, I can't see the PowerPoint. So let me try and pull that up really quick. There it is, sorry. And with that, um, came with the um, planning of work groups that helped us inform our strategic plan. I don't know if Christina, if you're able to post the strategic plan link um, to the chat and people can um, pull it up. But if you take our, our plan, our plan um, pretty much encompasses a lot of the um, requirements of the bills. And so for us, the question became, do we want to just continue on with our strategic plan and insert some of these into there? Or do we want to make this a deliverable of our work? And so the college decided to have a standalone EDI strategic plan and make it a deliverable. And so when these plans, you know, uh, sorry, when these bills came across, you know, and they were approved, 
the college had to make a decision. You know, we had to decide, are we moving forward? How are we going to do this? What's the work? Who's going to be at the table? And how are we going to move forward? And so with that came us um, reaching out to the campus community and sharing the information about the bills and also the information with regards to the strategic plan. And with that came our work plan. So we had to take our the we had to take the elements of the bills in comparison to our strategic plan and Ilda and I, because she is my co-lead and she's um, been a partner in all this work, we had to start put, putting that together. We built our work plan. And then um, from there, <clears throat> we started the alignment. And we noticed that a lot of the information, again, from those bills was already um, designed in a strategic plan. And so we started building our plan draft, which included you know, the items for 5194. We also reached out and looked at, you know, uh, 5227. Though 5194 doesn't tell us that we have to include these items like the campus climate assessment or the listening sessions. Um, that's really what's going to inform our plan. And so that's if when you take a look at our plan, you're going to see how we integrated these as activities to move forward with integrating and then expanding on that work. Um, and, and the work that we have planned for not only the bills, but the equity work that we have planned across campus is building teams. And, and those are small work teams. And so once we have that information from our campus climate assessment, now, for example, right now we have a, bill, a team that we are working with with regards to campus climate assessment. It's a very small team that consists of faculty, um, professional exempt. Uh, we have three students that are representative. We have um, uh, one administrator and so forth. And so these, uh, this team is gonna be responsible for facilitating the work to helping um, just uh, plan the distribution to help inform campus, to pretty much rally up and say, hey, this is the time for us to speak up for our voices to be heard and so forth. Um, the campus climate assessment, um, we also laid out a schedule so we per you know the way that this looks like is you know we conduct our survey we conduct our focus groups that's really the campus climate assessment piece of it then we look at our findings and then we have to look to, to see what our baselines are going to be and from there we're going to have to look at our implementation which then you circle back design again a work plan to start aligning the strategic plan with our dei plan and so from there, we have to start looking about where we're gonna have improvement, how we're gonna scale our work, what's gonna be our timeline for doing this. We know we have deadlines that are coming up, you know, on, in, at the end of June, the beginning of July. And so, you know, we have very short time crunch. And so, because we want to make sure that the survey does inform our DEI plan, we've set these deadlines into place and reached out again to this team to help us meet those deadlines. <clears throat> Do you want to move forward with that? Um, Christina, there you go. <laughs> and so once we have um, more information and what those recommendations are, um, our plan is to develop more work groups to help carry out this work. Um, another work group that we're currently planning on establishing is going to be for the faculty diversity program. And so what's that going to look like? So we know we have to review policies, processes and procedures and then start scaling that work. Um, we're going to have a team, you know, could it be for an outreach mentoring program? Appreciate that Parfait is, able, Parfait is able to present on that because that gave us a good idea of how maybe we want to scale that. And not to say YBC is not doing some of those things, but how can we improve on what we're doing now? And so then our plan with the work groups, instead of myself, Ilda or Steve or any of the administrators reporting out where we are with the work, we're hoping that the work groups are the ones that are reporting out to campus and providing information sessions, taking back that feedback, and then informing on our work. And so um, I know that was really fast. And, and so sorry about that. But if you, yeah, like I mentioned, if you have any specific, um, you know, questions about what we're doing, or if you want to see a draft version, you know, reach out to me personally, and then we can have that conversation, what that looks like. When we talk about scaling and implementation or what that looks like, you have to think about, and something that I just learned a few months ago from some of our practitioners on campus, but you know, um, that's conducting uh, or doing logic models and where we look at our work 
that we're currently conducting, what are going to be the resources that we're going to need, what's our outcomes going to be, you know, what are outputs and so forth. And so um, I don't know if you have any questions, but I think that's our mini session or part of kind of where we're at with things in our thought process to carrying out this work. <laughs> that's great, Jeanette. Thank you so much. I want to call attention to something that you said that I think is really important uh, to say again, and that is thinking about the approach to uh, creating and developing a sort of a standalone EDI plan versus uh, incorporating into um, an already existing strategic plan if that doesn't if these components don't already exist in that and I appreciate first and foremost the alignment of those two um, if at all possible um, and then a comment you made about really thinking about this work as a holistic between those two bills uh, even though 5194 calls out clearly those DEI strategic plans uh, you're taking the opportunity or Yakima is taking the opportunity to incorporate those components in 5227 within the whole equity plan, the whole enchilada. And so that's worked into that plan is operationalized accordingly. And I think that's a nice, nice approach to be able to think about it in that way, as opposed to two separate bills and what do I need to get done over here, uh, but being able to incorporate that. So thank you so much, Jeanette, for that. And you didn't get into a coughing fit, so yay. It happened right after, but here I am. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here despite that. I appreciate you. Okay, so I am going to introduce uh, Clark College and Dr. Rashida Willard. Not, I, I believe you're here. I'm Dr. here. Dr. Willard, are you here? You're here. Yay. Uh, welcome. So excited to hear about this from you and the good work that your team is doing. I don't know if you're here earlier, but I dropped the seed about the, the tracking piece that you've got in regards to your PD trainings that have gone full scale and what you've done there at the college to incorporate that already. Uh, so I'll go ahead and allow you to start. And if you have the chance to be able to speak to that as well, that would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Rashida Willard. I use she and her pronouns. I'm the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Clark College. Um, is somebody driving the slides or? Okay, <laughs> next slide. So our program, um, I, I just wanna talk about uh, alignment. So we really wanted to align our program, our training program that we developed uh, about th two or three years ago. Um, we wanted to align it with uh, the priorities of the college. And so you can see that um, not only are, is this program aligned with their strategies at the college, but it is also aligned with the board priorities. And it's also aligned with the state board priorities um, of leading with racial equity. So you can see that our um, Oak Clark College facilitates student learning by providing the conditions that improve educational outcomes and eliminates systemic uh, disparities among all groups. And so that's really one of the, the, the main things that we wanted to do was to align those goals. Uh, next slide. So the purpose of this program is called BUILD, Broadening Understanding Intercultural Leadership and Development. Um, it really was to build intercultural competencies and equity leadership um, in Clark College staff, faculty, and students. And that should really say intercultural competencies instead of intercultural competencies, because we know that, you know, um, building what we're trying to do is build skills. So skill building um, instead of building like a, a place that you've arrived to. And we know that you can never be culturally competent, but that um, we really wanted to start building that leadership and building skills and capacity for uh, members of our Clark College community. Um, and so we provide power, privilege, and inequity opportunities through listening, learning, and practicing. And that was really important to us when we built this program. We didn't want it to stay at training. You know, you go to a training and that's it. We wanted this program to be different. So you can listen, you can learn, but you can also practice. And you'll see some of the practicing pieces coming up here um, soon. So again, we aim to improve intercultural and multicultural competencies among our students and employees. 
Next slide. So um, we're particularly excited about how this program has um, shaped up in the last few years. Um, we made it into a certificated program and it's also a cohort model. So what we do is it's voluntary at this point. However, you know, things are shifting since the uh, 5227 bill. Um, we have had to kind of shift a little bit, but the, the base is here and the base is already done. But what we did was um, any employees that want to be build certified, they have to take an assessment before the program and then they take an assessment after. And um, the program consists of, you have to take at least five courses. One of them has to be equitable decision-making. So that's a core course that everybody has to take. And you complete these five modules over um, uh, from October to pretty much May, end of May. Um, and participants will be certified for two years after the training is complete, but we're actually rethinking that too. Um, so um, what they do is in, with the recertification process, we've actually put it into where they have to give back to the community. So they give back to other build cohorts. They train, they do um, some of our build dialogues, which you'll hear about. Um, and they meet once a quarter after certification to discuss best practices, refresh their training, and then talk about DEI issues. Next slide. So like I said, this is a cohort model. So we started off with the gold cohort. We named them uh, based on uh, colors. So gold cohort was first. Um, the blue cohort was next. And now we're on the green cohort. And it's usually about 35 to 40 people. I mean, um, I think this year we're actually at 43. Um, and they have... They go through the program together, but we break them out into build buddies because we find that learning really happens in these small groups. Um, so they learn in the big group together. They have plenty of time. Once a month, they can jump in and talk to each other in the big group, but they also build these uh, small uh, groups together. And so we assign five build buddies per group. They meet once a month or regularly, however they want. And these are the people that they go through the program with. And they also, at the end, will do a capstone project together. Um, so we've had folks that, you know, do better on their own than they do in a group. And we still make them, I guess you can say we make them, we still require them to meet with their build buddies. But if they feel really strongly that they want to present on their own, they can present on it on their own. Let's go to the next one. So my team has developed all of these trainings um, and we deliver all the trainings. So um, we offer, I don't know, I think there's maybe like, like five to six trainings maybe per quarter, um, but we try to, you know, get all of these in at some point and they're refreshing training every year. So every year they're like, I wanna do this training. I wanna do this training. So they're really excited about different trainings and they, um, they refresh this every year. So we might put some in the rotation. Some of them that are um, older, we may take out of the rotation, um, but we really wanted to, our trainings to be intersectional. We wanted them to, to um, deal with anti-racism. Um, we wanted them to leave with tools. Every training, we want folks to leave with tools to be able to practice whatever they've learned. And so you may get communications tools. You may get um, you know, decision-making tools. There's things that you leave with every training um, just to make sure that you're not just hearing, but you're actually putting it into practice as well. So they have to take at least five of these, but most of the people who sign up for the build program, they literally take every training. Um, so most of the time we don't have an issue with folks um, taking the required five courses. They take more than the five courses. 
Next slide. We also built in times for folks to be able to practice what they've learned um, and to go deeper, take a deeper dive into some of these um, topics. And so once a month, we do what, what is called the build chat. This is strictly for build participants only. Um, whoever, it, it's actually strictly for the cohort that's, that's going at the time. So um, they meet once a month, unless prior cohorts are training them, they may come in and do the, actually lead the talk, but it's a discussion to move through power, privilege, and inequity issues. So we, we go through implicit bias. So one of the build chats is implicit bias. They take the implicit association test and then they unpack it. Um, we do one on leading with race and break it all the way down. What does it mean to lead with race? We break down white supremacy culture. What does that look like at Clark College? And what do we do to interrupt it? Uh, we um, added facilitating conversations on equity and race and best practices for that. So teaching people, giving them skills to be able to move through these conversations so they're not just stuck. Um, current event articles. This one is brilliant. I probably Melissa came up with this. I don't remember, but we talked about um, did we talk about different events that are happening in the world right now as it pertains to um, equity. Um, so, for example, a conversation we might have is around um, you know trans athletes. Or um, <clears throat> we unpacked some articles um, that, what was it? The movie Prom, um, I think it was a prom that is um, played by an actor who is playing a gay person, but is not actually gay. Um, so stuff like that, that we, we try to unpack the articles so that people can start to see things in a, um, a racial and a um, like, a racial lens or an uh, inequity lens, um, because people oftentimes will read these articles and they don't, you know, get much out of it. But but for them to see this in the context of real life every day, how things are, how people are moving through um, everyday work is really important. All right, um, can you go to the next slide and play the video, but. Um, I don't know if you can play it, um, but you can stop it at the like the end. It starts to kind of run on at the end. schools to recruit and mentor students of color into and through STEM programs at Clark. Infusing equity into, into the very fabric of making decisions to transform this college. We're proposing the creation of a decal, just like with the one we have, like uh, the, safe zone, the safe zone penguin that symbolizes or supports. To do a build program starting with the student leadership training. Right, so embed it with student leadership, so then student leaders are able to recognize white supremacy culture on campus. And um, a multi-month event to bring in tax uh, preparers for low-income students to utilize at no cost. I wanted to look at how we could use the white supremacy culture framework and equity-mindedness uh, to disrupt racism in our syllabi. My, my topic is implicit bias and stereotype threats in academic advising. These were the greatest people to work with. And I think in, that's about I it. Really you can stop it there. Um, but you can see these are their capstone projects. So people have to propose a project and it can be something, it needs to be something that is actually implementable. They don't have to implement it. Build cohorts after them can implement it or they can implement it the next year if they want to. And they have, some of them they definitely have. Um, but really just getting them to think about how can they use the tools and the things that they've actually learned through the project 
or through the program and put it into action. Um, so they're not just kind of sitting there and not doing anything with their learning. Um, you can see these are some other folks that had uh, presentations. They talked about the importance of language and being brave. And um, so their, their proposal would be to use pronouns in all settings. So to, to operationalize using pronouns in all settings, um, meeting agreements and train the trainer models of advocates. Next slide. You can also see this one I thought was really great work, um, how some folks really looked at how white supremacy culture is embedded in the holiday schedule. Um, and so they studied all the different um, holidays and kind of talked about the pieces of white supremacy culture and how they were built. And then their proposal would be to give all employees 10 floating holidays so you can use it at any time for any holiday. Of course, you know, um, that's something that you can um, that we have to, there's a lot of work that goes behind it, but, you know, it was a great uh, presentation, but really these presentations help them to put that into action. Additionally, we use our build cohort members in other ways. So once they are done with the program, they are put into a roster as an equity representative. And so they're sent out into the college community so that my team is not taxed and my team is not tokenized. Um, so if you need somebody to serve on a committee, if you need you know, whatever you need, you can call a build person and they will be able to um, help you instead of, oftentimes we hear like, you, know, you want the same people um, and it's usually BIPOC folks or LGBTQ folks. And you know, we're just using those same folks. So this really gives us a, a chance to build engaged equity representatives on campus and continue to build them every year. Next slide, or is there any more? That seems to be the end of your presentation. Okay, that's the end. Yeah, yeah. so that's that's the program. Um, I don't I don't know if there's any questions or if there's anything else that I missed, but yes. Sort of giving it a second or two, Rashida. I was thank you for that. That was so incredible. And and uh, if those of you in the Zoom room may have noticed, uh, Melissa, the new member on our team, Melissa Williams, uh, was hired out of Clark College uh, most recently. And I'm really glad for her expertise and talent in this work that she helped to develop at Clark. Um, as she leads the equity learning series at the state board as well. So really glad for that. And so sorry, so sorry, Dr. Willard, for, for stealing her from you. <laughs> She's doing great work. Oh, incredible work, incredible work. Um, I wondered if you could speak really briefly to the tracking oh, piece that yes, you had right. uh, shared before so everyone can hear a little bit about that as well. Right, I forgot, I'm so sorry. So no, you're good. We actually developed in-house a tracking system. And so um, it's hard to do, unfortunately, when we're online because we have to manually enter folks. But when we're on um, campus, we call it this kiosk system because they just put a, a kiosk out and they scan their cards and it goes straight into the system and it says, you know, that they are, um, that they, that they're in the system. But if they don't scan and we have to put them in manually, it's fine. We just add their, um, their username and then it goes straight into the, um, into the system. And so that way we're able to track them, but it is a homegrown system. It's not perfect. Um, it's kind of manual, but it's what we have right now. And I don't think that um, a lot of folks are kind of dealing with that where they're like, how do you track? But we have, a, like I said, our system is homegrown and it was, uh, it was built. I forgot to say one more other thing. We do an assessment. I don't know if I said this before. We do an assessment before and after. The assessment that we do measures knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So it's, can you do the work? Or do you have the, the knowledge to do the work? Do you have the skill to do the work? And are you willing to actually do the work? 
And so we do those, those three pieces in that assessment as well. Thank you for that, Rashida. I was really glad that you can uh, pivot and just add to the, the information that you shared with this group today in regards to that. So it, just a signal to everybody to be thinking about what that might look like. Uh, yeah. I, I did mention earlier that uh, our team is looking at how we might uh, systematize that across all 34 colleges through the CTC link uh, uh, system. So we will keep you posted in the meantime um, be thinking about what that looks like on your own campus as well in regards to tracking all of the good training uh, that will eventually go full scale across and the And I'm colleges. happy to help, like if you, you know, want to look at the system and all of those things, we can do that too. So you can just contact me and I can, I can do that and maybe it can be built out. That's know, great. So. Would love that, Rashida. Absolutely. So we are running beautiful on time. And I want to, again, draw your attention to that Google Doc. If there's any questions that you would like to have answered, uh, thinking about uh, how we might get that to you as soon as possible. We've got some recordings to share out uh, to everybody as well across all three of these sessions that occurred this uh, month. So thank you so much for joining in today and and uh, joining us and hearing all about the good work that is already going on across your colleges um, and how we can work together collectively to uh, advance that even further. You'll see in front of you the contact information for everybody involved uh, here with the state board. Uh, we also have information, I think the previous slide for the college showcase contacts as well. So feel free to uh, make contact with those individual colleges as we learned a little bit more about the work that they're doing uh, and that has that will continue to impact um, our students, particularly our students of color and minoritized students. So with that, uh, I think that we will say goodbye and thank you to all of you, especially our college showcase folks, uh, Dr. Willard, Parfait Basilay, uh, Jeanette, I always want to say JQ, Jeanette Quintero uh, for being here with us today and sharing that summer. Big props to you um, and Julie Hess as well, working with the EDI team. So with that, hope we get the chance to connect again. Thank you so very much. Uh, feel free to reach in at any time whatsoever if you'd like to meet with us individually or with your with a team of folks on your campus. We are open and available to any any of that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.